Ron James is the writer, director, and producer of Accidental Truth, UFO Revelations that came out in April of this year. It's won 18 awards worldwide, and he's previously created feature-length documentaries on Travis Walton, Marilyn Monroe, and UFO Disclosure. And he's here on Exopolitics Today to discuss his documentary and the latest developments on UFO Disclosure. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome, Ron, to ExoPolitics Today. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be on your show. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Thank you. Well, I, I know you've done quite a lot of work in the AV industry. You go back several decades, and I think it's uh, uh, since 1998, and you, you worked with some some pretty big names in the music industry, the Beach Boys, Guns N' Roses. So you want to tell us about that? Yeah, you know, in my, in my other life that has nothing to do with ufology, I, I own a video production company, and uh, for a while I was doing a lot of big music acts. I was, uh, I was a main camera person for the Guns N' Roses Appetite for Democracy movie. I actually got to be on stage for the whole show because I got to pick which camera I wanted to run. And I did the band interviews and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I was on stage with the entire band for the entire show. That was that was absolutely cool. And then I did the Beach Boys. I did the Smashing Pumpkins, Oceana. Um, Kendrick Lamar actually filmed a video of my spaceship at my studio. I had a set of a spaceship like Star Trek. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Vintage Trouble, Alice in Wonderland, um, Smash, yeah, I said Smashing Pumpkins, uh, just a bunch of them. And doing, I got the music bug, and now I'm actually a, a playing musician myself. I picked it up during COVID, and I've gotten to the point where we're going out and playing in front of people. So it's pretty fun. I, I've reinvented myself as a rock star for my 60th birthday. <laughs> Well, that's 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 great. Change change of life is always. Uh, I feel bad for the audiences, but you know it's 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 about me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I know you uh, back in the days when uh, DVDs were popular. I mean, you made 200 DVDs on paranormal, new science, metaphysics. So yeah, I, mean, I, uh, that, I, I, I moved about to that. Sedona, which is like the metaphysical capital of the world, and I set up studios around town not all at the same time, but one after the other. And I'd bring in all these experts about everything from sacred geometry to crystal healing. And we would just shoot these instructional videos. And um, yeah, I ended up making about 250 different productions. Um, and we were selling them worldwide through New Age bookstores when YouTube came along and basically stole all our stuff. And that was the end of that business. Yeah, I think uh, you actually got interested in the UFO topic from one of the X conferences uh, that uh, Stephen Bassett organized. I think, uh, was it the 2009 yeah. X conference? I think I was actually there. I was part of you that. You were there. It was, um, it was either 2008 or 2009. I did this, uh, two or more for sure. And then I did the citizen hearing forum after that. But the um, yeah, I met Steve Bassett in Sedona. And I had always been kind of an armchair aficionado of the UFO topic. But he actually talked to me about live streaming and videotaping and producing his ex-conference in D.C. And so I went out there and did it. And I got to meet all these guys that I'd seen on TV. I got to meet you. And um, I started really realizing how important this topic was and, and how it's the one of the biggest deceptions ever put on humanity. And it just kind of sucked me in. I got more and more involved. But Edgar Mitchell, I mean, I, I saw him and sat next to him and, uh, you know, I, I kind of felt that uh, he was holding back a lot. I mean, I, I got the sense yeah. that he knew a lot, but he was just like very controlled in how much he revealed. It was like he'd been debriefed and, yeah, so what did you think of Edgar Mitchell? Well, you know, it's really funny that you bring that up and you and I hadn't talked about this before. Um, so it's interesting that you honed in on it. In in the film that we're going to talk about pretty soon, Accidental Truth, there's part of a never released interview that I shot with Edgar Mitchell at one of the X conferences. And um, I think it was it, it was maybe the first one. But when I was interviewing him, the biggest thing that I wanted to get out of him was, you know, you got on a rocket, you went to the moon, you walked on the moon. How did it feel? And 
I couldn't get that out of him. I couldn't get that sense of, of that experience and how it affected him. Now, we know that on the way back from the moon, he had a very spiritually transformative experience and he went on to found the Institute of Noetic Science and he had a very profound experience that, um, that we do know that he went through. But yeah, it was always like he just wasn't completely engaged. And it really makes you wonder what if there's a process that these astronauts go through when they get back, especially if they've seen something that, you know, debriefing could be an understatement. It could just really end up kind of um, minimizing the experience, for lack of a better way to describe it. But I definitely felt like he'd been through something that made him not quite able to be completely in touch with his experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I think actually Richard Hoagland came up with that point. He, he made the same point that you know, people that have been out in space, you would think they would just have all these incredible emotions. I mean, because you're out in space, yeah. you know, incredible vistas out there, but they come back and it's just you know, matter of fact. He, he said it was like to him, he thought that they had been through some kind of mind control debriefing. That was hope. I, I, I think that might be possible. I don't have evidence for it. Well, except for the anecdotal evidence, like what we're talking about. But, you know, it would make sense because we know that that these astronauts saw things. I mean, there's there's uh, suppressed transmissions that have that have come to the surface that where they're talking about, oh, look, they're watching us. You know, I mean, this stuff, these are highly trained, highly uh, credible people. And they're still saying these things. And it, it's just another example of how effective the suppression of this information has been. I mean, we can have these people doing this stuff and it's just like, wow, uh, <laughs> they can come out, they can, we can have radio transmissions where we're hearing that they're, they're watching us. Oh, look, look at that. What was that? You know, all these different things that have come through um, all the way up to the space shuttle, but then they still manage to come up with ways to suppress it and cover it up and make us think it's not real. It's, it's really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. So uh, 2008, 2009, you get exposed to um, ex-conference, Steve Bassett, all these uh, UFO experts, and uh, eventually you get to become the director for media relations for MUFON, the world's largest UFO organization. So you want to tell us about that particular journey? Yeah, you know, it's a long road. When um, I, I think it was at the second ex-conference that I was at, I, I met up with Jennifer Stein, uh, who's another filmmaker that that I'm very good friends with. And we started shooting interviews at the conference where we would have like Richard Dolan talking to Danny Sheehan. It was a whole new concept of let's put two experts together and film the conversation that they're having amongst themselves. And um, th that that format's been, they're starting to copy it on ancient aliens and other things, but we were the ones that did it first, I think. Um, that turned into the Disclosure Dialogues, which was a five disc set, a feature documentary. And I finished it up in 2011. And then it had five or four accompanying discs where we had the full length interviews of like Steve Bassett talking to Paul Davids, Danny Sheehan talking to Richard Dolan. Uh, I interviewed George Knapp. I interviewed George Norrie. Uh, it was just a, a fascinating set of, of things. Um, and we won the uh, EBE awards for it that year. We won best film and, pe and people's choice. And so I was always dabbling in making this stuff. And um, I ran into uh, MUFON people at the sim Paula Harris's gig. I think it was the last one she did in Laughlin or it was the second to last one. And I suggested that we do MUFON television as an online subscription based portal where all their stuff could live. And so they, uh, after about six months of negotiation, we entered into a joint venture. And then after MUFON leadership got changed up, um, my position and, and my contract was was reevaluated and we worked everything out and they offered me the media relations director position. And honestly, I, I love doing it. It's not a paid position. MUFON's pretty much all volunteer, but uh, I do make a little bit of money owning MUFON television because we have thousands of subscribers. But yeah, I get to work on Ancient Aliens. I get to work on The Proof Is Out There. I get to meet all these people in all these shows. And whenever somebody comes to us and they want to use our content or interview people within the organization, I'm kind of the person that handles that process. So it's really fun. And MUFON, I have to say before we get off the topic, Dave McDonald took over MUFON. This organization has grown and evolved by leaps and bounds. 
when I first got involved with MUFON, I had some ideas and some visions for how I wanted to see things go and what I pictured it as being. Because, you know, Michael, as the whole UFO thing gets bigger and bigger and more and more people are realizing that it's real, we need a community to coalesce around where people can talk to each other and find friends and like-minded folks. And MUFON is stepping into those shoes as the, the worldwide community for people that care about the topic. And then the Washington DC work that we've been doing off the charts. If you want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing behind the scenes somewhere in this, I, that's a conversation I'd love to have too. We've been very busy in Washington DC. I've heard people talking about all the work they're doing there and I'm not going to say they're not doing work there, but I know that we're there. We're behind closed doors. We're having over so far, we're well over 200 meetings with Congress people and staff. And we're doing a whole bunch of things that they will kind of keep them quiet about. But if you want to know more, I could tell you, I could tell you more. Sure. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but let's uh, look, talk a little bit about the, the video, the documentary that you came out with uh, that uh, was released in April of this year. Uh, it's on all those awards, Accidental Truth, your re Revelations. So, you know, the, the title is kind of like, it's very striking. So why did you call it Accidental Truth? Well, you know, it was first, I got the idea to make the doc because I didn't want to make another UFO film unless I could move the ball. And I interviewed Lou Elizondo in 2018. It's one of the only studio quality interviews that he's done that is not carefully regulated. And in it, he said a couple things that inadvertently and overtly that he didn't really mean to say. And I'm like, you know, there's more in what you didn't say than there is in what you did. And that's where I kind of came up with the idea, accidental truth. And I'd like to say I, I thought up the phrase. I actually thought it was a, an original uh, phrase, but it, it, it's been used out there a couple other times. So I can't say I made it up, although I thought I did. Um, but yeah, it's all about it, in it is like we define an accidental truth as um, uh, something that when, when evidence and conversation leads people to a conclusion, that wasn't originally intended to be revealed. And there's a lot of accidental truths in, in the film where somebody will say something and go, oh, whoops, I shouldn't have said that. Um, and it really tells the story in a very cohesive manner of what we've been dealing with for the last you know, 100 years and lays it out in a way that's evidence-based and leaves little room for debate. And that's what I wanted to do. Okay, well, you got to uh, interview Louis Elizondo and uh, he came out while well, he got very famous because of that uh, interview with the New York Times in 2017 and uh, he was heading up a tip so and I know he's been quite a I mean I don't know if this is because he is a controversial character or because the UFO community tends to nitpick over qualifications I saw this happen with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso, and the same thing seems to have happened with Lou Elizondo. You know that people nitpick over details and and then jump to the conclusion that well, you know, the I isn't dotted properly or the T is not crossed properly, so he must be a fraud. What well, you know, it's that? interesting. Corso is he's his own unique situation. Everything about Corso's background was pretty verifiable. Where he worked, what he did. Now, whether or not these things actually happened. That's really where the debate comes from with Corso. But with Lou, the debate seems to be about whether or not he really ever did the things he said he did. And my personal interaction with him and the research that I did uh, indicate that, yes, of course, he's totally for real. And what people don't understand is that there's a lot of different ways that these organizations and agencies weave together. Uh, civilian contractors can work in classified programs, but they're not officially part of the government. Uh, Lou, from what I understand, had a history in the military, then was doing intelligence work as a civilian contractor. And so his his pedigree is legit. But for people that are looking for this military um, kind of paper trail, that, that's that's hard to find. And then, of course, there's a lot of programs that are in existence that are kind of like what they call ad hoc programs. And what I mean by that is, and John Alexander is a great example, him and a bunch of people kind of got together that had similar interest in the UFO thing. And they might not have been under an official government program, but they were still a bunch of government guys that had access to all of the government resources that were running a program. But 
maybe not necessarily an official sanctioned named budgeted program but it was still just as legit so you know when atip it became after everything got moved to dod you know that was just a nickname they formed in-house and but they were still doing the work um so all the people that are dogging lou for his background uh, I, I don't think that's the right path to take with Mr. Elizondo. I think that he's totally, his background is legit. The things that he did is legit. Um, I think that if people want to look into, you know, anything about Lou, uh, it's really the fact that he's probably still working. He's, he's still connected and he has handlers and he's doing what he can do. Um, I'm not aware of what his personal feelings are but I, i'm convinced that he's part of this program um and you have to respect him he's honoring his oath and you know he's he's a, he's overall a good guy he's a hero as far as i'm concerned um so yeah people can question his past but we have to understand these people come out and they're doing what they can but they also are very taking very seriously the oaths and the promises and the commitments that they made and if making full disclosure is above his pay grade, he's in an organization where that has to be respected. It's called the U.S. military and the U.S. intelligence community. You don't just decide that I'm the guy that's going to do this. It's, it, you know, so he's a, he's a soldier and a patriot. And thank goodness we have people that have that level of honor, even though people tend to um, look at it from different directions. Well, I know one of the points of controversy, I mean, I, I don't think it's at all debatable that, you know, he, he was in some position with ATIP and that up until 2017, he uh, was running whatever was, uh, was remained of that program, even though it wasn't funded at that point. And then he resigned because, and I think in his words, uh, that the... Uh, U.S. military wasn't taking the UFO threat seriously enough. And so that's a, a debate, debatable point because, you know, some people say, well, UFOs are not a threat. They've never been a threat. Um, if they were, you know, <laughs> we would have been gone a long time ago. But now all of a sudden this narrative has emerged that UFOs are a threat. Is is that really just wholly contrived by UFO researchers that, that want to project this idea that UFOs are a threat so that the Pentagon and the general public takes it seriously? Well, I think that, that, you know, the people that say that they're trying to guide this through the body politic, Christopher Mellon and Lou, especially Chris, um, the acknowledgement of a potential threat will get the attention of people more than uh, just so oh, they're little green men, little green men, crazy things in our airspace. We can't identify. Uh Oh, we better find out what they are. Uh, a lot of people are against the threat narrative. Um, I think Lou is against the threat narrative. He came out in the show unidentified and talked about how that probably wasn't the right way to, to perceive them. But if, if the threat narrative has enabled mainstream attention and politicians in Washington that might not normally have gotten involved, well, okay. As long as it doesn't, get us into a point where we're, you know, destroying uh, things that we shouldn't be destroying. And when we look at Lou in 2017 and, and the resignation letter that he wrote, the one factor that we cannot overlook is the fact that the TTSA to the Stars Academy, Tom DeLong's organization with Lou and Chris and all these guys from the intelligence community, this was already formed and waiting in the wings. And so this was not just a spontaneous, Lou was frustrated, I'm resigning. It was a triggering event that was orchestrated in my opinion. And I, I can't say that for sure. And I don't wanna be misquoting facts, but the way I see it, they, they had the TTSA organized. Lou made a big sacrifice when he wrote that resignation letter, um, but he knew that the TTSA was there and that they had plans to raise a lot of money. And all of these guys, the TTSA would have moved forward with millions and millions of dollars and continued to be a conduit for information to come out to the public. But things didn't quite work out the way they thought. And so um, the, it, it didn't implode. TTSA is still around. Hey, Tom. But um, it, it's not the original thing that it was supposed to be. And it was mostly because they didn't raise enough money. 
And so all of the guys that, that had a piece of this and were expecting it to be something that they could rely on financially moving forward, that didn't materialize to a satisfactory extent. And so, yeah, there's, it's, it's a whole long twisted story, but the resignation letter did, did not come in a vacuum. Let's just put it that way. Well, I mean, actually, uh, well, one of the things that was fascinating was that there were two resignation letters, one a kind of pro forma to his immediate superior, and then another one, I think it was to General Mark Milley, which suggested that people at that high level were kind of very interested in ATIP and getting informal briefings. So, yeah, do, do you want to kind of talk about, you know, why there were two resignation letters? One, you know, the one to Milley was kind of much more detailed. Well, I, th I think that there was a problem getting to uh, getting to Millie. You know, the, it, it, it kind of surprised me. But the, it, when you're that high up at the DOD, you'd think that if you want to talk to the director, um, you're, you're going to be able to. You think that if you want to talk to the, the Secretary of Defense, you're going to get a meeting. But apparently there was a lot of filters between what they were doing at ATIP and the top of the food chain. And I can see where that would be very frustrating. And so, um, and then there was also this in, internal stuff going on with, uh, you know, that we could talk about this later too, the fundamentalist aspect of this where, where there's a lot of people inside government and the military and the front facing crowd that think that this is a topic for religious reasons that we should not be dabbling in. And he actually encountered a lot of that kind of resistance with his program. And so the idea that, that that he had to resign and, and make some noise and write this letter directly to the Secretary of Defense because he couldn't get the opportunity to go sit down with them because there are multiple layers of, uh, of gatekeepers. Kind of odd to me, but mm -hmm. it is what it is, I guess. Well, there, there's um, a new book that's just came up, came up there by Dr. James Lakatsky and Colm Kelher that talk about the, the roles of uh, ATIP and its predecessor, predecessor, ORSAP, and they point out that actually it was uh, ORSAP that got the funding mm -hmm. from yeah. Senator Harry Reid and Bigelow yeah. and all of that. So, you know, what, 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 the, what kind of uh, help was that book in clarifying this kind of history about ATIP and the funding and Senator Harry Reid and the Bigelow Corporation? It's, it certainly served a certain purpose, but the... Um, you know, there, there's like the, the basement room is a guy that does a really good podcast. He has Nick Pope on there a lot. And they've really attacked the whole Ossop program. You know, ooh, werewolves and goblins. And the government's investing in that. But there's a little truth to it. Well, there's obviously it was kind of weird that they were doing that. But um, they point to the fact that these esoteric paranormal topics were being uh, researched and government money was going to it. And certain people got in and objected to that happening. Um, in a lot of ways, that's exactly what happened. There were there were members of the, the government inside DOD uh, that just thought, what are we spending money on this stuff for? But the, the truth that they kind of skim over isn't that they thought it was far out and, and too, too crazy and unbelievable. It's that they thought that it was forces that we shouldn't be playing with more than more than the uh, former. And so. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't a fly on the wall in the room. I just have my research. But the whole story is is fascinating. And, you know, Skinwalkers of the Pentagon, good book. George Knapp was involved. Um, you know, it kind of, it, it laid some important stuff out and it, it clarified a certain version of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating book. Uh, well, one of the photos that you discussed in the uh, documentary Accidental Truth was this Calvine UFO photo taken in August 1990 by two British hikers, and then it kind of like got uh, they, they submitted it to the British Ministry of Defense and it disappeared for 32 years and then it reappeared. So, you want to talk about that? What, why is that an important photo? Well, you know, I was interviewing in, in Accidental Truth, there's literally three um, different interviews with Nick Pope 2009, 2020, 2021, or two. Um, and one of the things that he talked about during one of these interviews was how he had this picture on his wall while he was at the Ministry of Defense of this supposed UFO photo that the guys in Calvine, Scotland had taken. And that at some point they came and took it off the wall and it disappeared into being classified, 
even though the British MOD uh, supposedly released all of their UFO information, they chose to keep that picture classified. And when I was making the film, that's where that stopped. Uh, but then in post-production, this picture popped up and, and the guy claiming that, no, this is the actual picture. So we added it in at the last minute to kind of illustrate how there are people uh, working within these organizations that have the ability to suppress evidence and will do it. Um, since then, there's been some debate about whether this Calvin, photo, Calvin photograph is real or not. Uh, I'm not sure where, where I stand on it, but um, it, was a, it was a last minute addition that we're like, well, wait a minute, we can't say it's classified until 2072, but by the time the movie comes out, there's the picture. So we added in the, the part about the picture surfacing uh, just in time. And it, it's it's interesting. Yeah, well, it is a it is a fascinating uh, picture. So um, you know, the question is, well, is it ours or is it theirs? I mean, that's you know, that's the question these days. I, mean, I know it looks like a big you know balloon, a, a diamond shaped balloon. But so who knows, right? Rather, mm -hmm. but but why would they classify it? And it was originally, if, if this is the original photo, which people are debating, but the original photo, whether it's this or something else. When they released all the UFO information, they decided that there was a reason to keep that photo classified until 2072. And the question is, well, why? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we mentioned Edgar Mitchell, and one of the things that emerged with um, his passing was uh, a document, a 15-page document of a, a summary of a meeting between Admiral... Uh, Thomas Wilson and Dr. Eric Davis in 2002, where they discussed uh, Admiral Wilson's efforts to find out what's really going on in a, in a corporate project involving a crashed alien spacecraft. So, yeah, can you talk about that particular document? Yeah, so um, in the archives of Edgar Mitchell was supposedly some notes that Eric Davis, Dr. Eric Davis, had taken. And, and they did, they detailed a meeting between Eric Davis and Admiral Wilson, where they talked about the fact that as a very high ranking, uh, he wasn't head of DIA at the time, but he was pretty much up there. He had the legal right to look into anything he wanted to within government programs, classified stuff. He went looking for information that would verify the whole UFO thing and was basically told that he wasn't, that he didn't have the authority to be read in. And, this is the notes of the conversation where Wilson described this to Eric Davis. Uh, obviously, it's not a recording. Wilson denies it, but by protocol and the rules of his job, he would have to deny it. Um, Eric Davis says he can't confirm or deny, which usually means it's true. Um, and so these notes serve as a, you know some form of documentation about the fact that we have these programs. But there's a lot more stuff coming out. And I might add, I just executive produced a short film about the Wilson Davis memo. It's called The Memo, and it's going to be coming out pretty soon uh, in film festivals and stuff. And we're taking the, the dramatization uh, of it. It's a 15-minute short film about the, the whole thing. And then we're building a little documentary around it. So you'll be seeing another film from me soon. Um, it's going to be a little different than stuff I've done in the past. But we're going to take a deep dive into the, the whole story. Well, it is a fascinating story, and I mean, for those that aren't aware, I mean, uh, uh, Admiral Wilson, I mean, at the time in 1997, and Edgar Mitchell attended that meeting with mm -hmm. Admiral Wilson and Stephen Greer, and I think, Greer, uh, yeah. and Willard, Commander Willard, and and that uh, uh, Wilson was outraged that he could not get out access to th to the files where th this corporation was uh, doing some kind of study. Of captured UFOs and 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 Wilson was the um, at the time uh, vice director of the Defense Intelligence yeah. Agency. So you know, very senior you know, position. They said they were going to stop his promotion. He'd never be director if he kept uh, yeah. toting this. I can tell you something that that nobody else knows, um, and that is that I gave Tim Burchett a list of people that if they ever get the chance to, if the, if the UFO whistleblowers thing comes to fruition, they get all the details worked out about how it's gonna go, a list of people that needed to be called into a skiff and, and talked to. And Admiral Wilson was at the top of the list. And so there is there are rumors that 
he may talk if he if he's asked to and if he's given the proper clearances. And I was very, very strongly suggesting to Tim Burchett, because I've met with him more than once, and that he would be like at the top of the list of who are you going to call in that could give us some information. And he's right there. Well, I know in that uh, document, the 15 page document, uh, I, I believe uh, Wilson described how he had applied for access to those to that project to the special access program oversight committee within mm -hmm. the Pentagon and, and and the Pentagon sided with the corporate attorneys, which is astounding that that oversight committee in the Pentagon would side with the corporation over the sitting vice director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and say, no, we're going to side with the corporation and their right to deny you access. I know. Isn't that insane? And and I totally believe it. And, you know, Christopher Mellon was uh, the chairman of the uh, Special Access Program Oversight Committee when he was Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. And we, as we discuss in the film, when he first came out and started being vocal about the UFO topic, he published this article in the, in the newspaper that said, oh, yeah, the government's not studying this stuff. And I interviewed him and I called him on it. And I'm like, Chris, how can you say that? If you were the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and you're saying now that there's no interest in the UFO topic and, and you would know because you had access to this stuff, how do you reconcile that with the fact that we have a ton of evidence that that's just not true? And you'll have to watch Accidental Truth to see how he answers that, but it's a mind-blowing answer. Well, that's fascinating. I mean, what was Christopher Mellon on that Special Access Program Oversight Committee at the time uh, Admiral Wilson requested access and was denied? I'm not sure I can speak to that, but the, I think he might have come afterwards. Okay. Well, that, that's a fascinating question. Yeah, well, er Eric, you know what? That won't be hard to figure out. So if there are any viewers out there want to do a little quick dive into that, um, yeah, that's a that would be an interesting connection. Well, well, Dr. Eric Davis, he's a kind of very pivotal figure in all of this. And, and of course, he's part of that 15-page uh, document that details his meeting with uh, Admiral Wilson. And then he's going to the U.S. Congress and giving briefings about this topic. So you know, what, what did uh, Eric Davis say to Congress when, I think it was 2019, when he was going there giving... Or 18, he was giving briefings to Congress? You know, he was giving slides, and in one of the slides, and the New York Times published it, he referenced off-world craft. It was just mentioned in a paragraph, but and, and there was no official elaboration that we have details of, but it was enough. And if you look into Eric Davis and his history, there's this little clique of guys that goes all the way back to the 80s and, and before. Um, and I call them the mid-level people. You have, like, John Alexander, Hal Putoff, Eric Davis and 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 there and a whole circle of people around them, Jim Semivan. Uh, you know, these guys were part of numerous ad hoc groups and groups that were trying to get to the bottom of stuff. But I don't think they're the they're, they're not the managers of the information. These are guys at mid-level government that wanted to try to get to the bottom of what was going on. Hey, did Roswell really happen? But they're not the guys that knew for sure that it really happened, and they're not the guys that were involved in the cover-up. They're the guys inside government, one of the first groups that tried to get to whoever it is. Um, and so a lot of people m mistake this group as being the, the conspiracy uh, cover up guys that are responsible for keeping the information from us. But they're, I don't think they are. I think they're just uh, people that were inside of government, had a certain amount of power and, and ability and wanted to get to the bottom of it because they never did. I mean, John Alexander to this day says nothing happened at Roswell. You know, I was like, come on, man. Well, we have uh, in the Department of Defense now this uh, All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, <laughs> uh, headed by uh, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, and that and Poor that guy. tends to focus just on UAP sightings and yeah. kind of like you know follows the old Blue uh, Project Blue Book model of you know, you know coming. Well, up it's with just like Tim said, Congressman Congressman Burchett, Tim, Tim Burchett just said in his latest interview after getting taken into the skiff. Um, and told stuff. Everything is now compartmentalized. The, the, this guy that's running this program is given a certain amount of information, and so he has to extrapolate from that. 
And so he can't be held responsible for the fact that he's unable to, to tell us about stuff. When you watch those first UFO hearings that we pointed out in the movie, Accidental Truth, Moultrie and Bray were both like, oh, we don't have access to that within our, our, our office. And so this whole thing is still super compartmentalized. And like NASA has this committee that's going to study this stuff. Well, it's garbage in, garbage out. If they're only given a certain amount of information, then they're only going to produce a certain amount of conclusions. And to this day, we are suffering from the fact that nobody is being given the whole enchilada. And we might even be in a situation where not that many, if anybody, is in possession of the whole breadth of information. The, the, one of the things that Tim Burchett talks about in the movie is that, you know, people die. People take their secrets to the grave and evidence gets destroyed. And wouldn't it be a shame if the true history of us all the way down to the last detail is gone? And it's it's possible. Well, you know, that's uh, something that hopefully we'll be able to learn uh, fairly soon. But I noticed that there has been this kind of very interesting uh, development where on the one hand you have the Pentagon, the Arrow office saying, well, you know, we, you know, there's these UFOs, they're real, they're a national security threat and that kind of narrative. But then you have within the uh, House of Representatives, you have this uh, UAP caucus now with Tim Bouchette and Anna Luna that, that are talking about crashed UFOs and, and they're, they're on the hunt for these crashed UFOs saying that credible witnesses have come forward to say that this is real and mm -hmm. we want to get to the bottom of it. So, you know, the public is really intrigued by that and, you know, Sean Kirkpatrick and his whole, well, UAPs, sightings, we, we don't know what they are. That's well, see, he's not, like, Kirkpatrick isn't, isn't being given that information, you know, and, and so he can only comment on what he's been given. And he's a, you know, he's a credible scientist. I don't think he's a dishonest guy. He's just not being, and this is how they do this. It's like, okay, it, it's like that thing about blind people and elephants. If you let a blind person touch a part of an elephant, how are they going to describe the elephant? And whoever is managing this information is still making sure that it's doled out piecemeal. And so in what, and they keep coming up with these acronyms. I mean, sooner or later, they're going to run out of stuff to, to call it, you know, because ever since 2017, we've had what, five or six of these departments, a, a blah, 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 blah. And they all get a little bit of information. They all regurgitate a little bit of information, nothing conclusive. And we all know it's a big dog and pony show. And we're just watching it, scratching our heads. Or some of us are. Some of us are buying it hook, line, and sinker. You know, but mm -hmm. people that know this, the field, we all know what's going on. Well, we know David Grush was uh, part, he was the liaison for the NRO to the UAP task force and then to its, assessor, uh, its successor, AIMSOG. AIM and uh, he says that he reported up that food chain that uh, he had spoken to or he knew of up to 40 witnesses that were knowledgeable about these uh, crashed UFOs that were being studied that involved non-human intelligence. So he says that he did report that up that food chain. So I guess the question is, you know, did Sean Kirkpatrick come in at a certain point and not receive that information, that intel, or did he receive it and he's just, you know, keeping it mum? Well, I think... Uh see right now it's all speculation so i think grush you know he's got the background in the intelligence community he had friends he had connections he was also the liaison for the for the for this program and so he went in and started utilizing his connections to have certain conversations and those conversations were like yeah that's that stuff happened we have crashed re, uh, recovery programs we have technology that we've gotten from off-world craft we have all that stuff and it was studied possibly here 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 and here but when he reports it up the food chain um what evidence is he is he providing with it and then is is that verifiable and then is it within the scope of what the orders are within that particular organization um if they're told to study military sightings, uh, active UFO sightings, then they're going to put the this, the this stuff that's you know potentially uh, not documented off on the back burner, and they're not going to talk about it. And they're not going to bring it out. So it's just another example of how effective the compartmentalization is. And I don't know how much evidence David Grush was able to emerge with. None of us know that yet. Um, supposedly, there's names and references, but are there samples and materials? 
probably not. Are there pictures of these craft that he's in possession of? No. So even though he was able to relay this information, he wasn't able to walk in with a big box of stuff and drop it on somebody's desk. And so that's why we're not seeing it officially embraced. Well, <laughs> that's that's one reason. Of course, the other reason we're not seeing it officially embraced is, is obvious. It's not going to be released. But then that would implicate all these people. And I'm not sure that they're all guilty of, of this. I think they're just pawns in a lot of cases. Well, in, in Accident, Accidental Truth, you discuss the new narrative. So you know, what is that? Yeah, this is what, ever since the 2017 big reveal about the ATIP program, the new narrative is Project Blue Book concluded, government and industry had no interest in the UFO topic until Robert Bigelow got uh, some funding for, for the OSOP program, the Bigelow Aerospace and all this. And in between then, nothing was happening. And, and so they, they, they want to convince us that this is true because it's during that 50, 60 year period where all of the, uh, all, all of the really good stuff happened. That's when we got the materials. That's when we started the reverse engineering programs. That's where things got buried in government and industry and silos. And now they're faced with a situation where they're going to have to eventually come clean about the fact that this stuff exists, but they can't really tell the truth about the evolution of it because the too many people and companies and organizations would be culpable for what is really an illegal deception. So the powers that be are caught between a rock and a hard place. We have, we're gonna have to get the information out that we're not the only intelligent life form in the universe uh, before it becomes so obvious that we all have egg on our face. But we have to do it in such a way that we get this plausible deniability and, and nobody you know, faces any serious repercussions for what they've done. And we can protect our secrets and, and the companies like the Lockheeds and, and the Raytheons and the, the North of Grumman's that have all gotten a little bit of something and develop things from foreign technology can um, can keep their secrets. So the new narrative is the government hasn't been involved until now. And we're just now starting to pay attention to it. And we kind of blow that out of the water in the movie because we have General Samford in the 50s saying the exact same things that the Lou Elizondos and the people that have come out now do. In fact, there's a really difficult scene in the movie where uh, General Samford says, well, these things are definitely, they're not ours, uh, but we are committed to, to studying them. And then Lou Elizondo pops on and goes, well, government and industry are, well, we're committed to trying to get to the bottom of what these things are. And it's like nobody even gave him a new script. And so this new narrative has been forced upon us and some people that are willing to play the ball within the UFO community and support the new narrative are getting to be the ones you see on TV all the time. And the people that are calling BS on it, they're kind of being pushed aside out of the mainstream. But that's what Accidental Truth is all about, is blowing the new narrative story out of the water. It's like, come on, guys, you're going to have to admit that you got this stuff, that you've been studying it, what it is, where it came from, and what it means. And they're not there yet. So I made the movie to try and give them less room to breathe, and I think it worked. Well, <laughs> one, told it worked. well, I mean, people got really excited by this uh, congressional hearing uh, by the House Oversight Committee in July 26 of, of this year, where uh, David Grush and David Fravor and Ryan Graves came up and talked about crash retrievals and UAPs and so forth. Uh, and but David Fravor, uh, sorry, uh, David Grush, he was the kind of center of attra attraction in terms of saying that yes, uh, crashed UFO involving non-human intelligence are in the possession of of the government and corporations, but couldn't give any details. But was saying that he can do it in a in a classified setting, in a skiff setting. So you know, they were denied that. The the, the sitting congressman Tim Burchett, everybody else in that committee. And this wasn't a big congressional hearing held in the halls of Congress. This was in a little hearing room in one of the office buildings. It was very unofficial. And, it, and we pushed hard to have this. And MUFON was behind um, helping to get this done. So, so this is one of the kind of things that we've been doing in D.C. Um, but, yeah, the, 
the fact that they couldn't get crush into a skiff and, and get access to that stuff it was it was kind of sad um at the very beginning of that hearing tim burchett mentions accidental truth it's the first ufo film that's ever been read into the congressional record i was super stoked but yeah. um yeah the fact it, it what he's been up against with opposition to his quest for information is is verifiable and documented there is that there are people that are really going to fight the stuff coming out and they're going to fight our sitting Congress people. They're going to ignore the entire rules of process and procedure that our democracy is set up on. They're just simply not going to comply and they're going to take this secret and keep it as long as they possibly can. And um, even our most powerful people politically are having trouble getting any cooperation. And there's, you know, what's wrong with that picture really? Yeah, I mean, there are, it is, it is a struggle. But one of the things that I just wanted to, you know, get any insight about was that, yeah, we have those congressional, that congressional hearing in July 26 with David Fravor, uh, David Grush and Fravor and so forth. But then there were uh, meetings, uh, in the House, Senate and Intelligence Committees had classified hearings on the on this topic on the UFO topic in March of 2022, so right. and, and I believe Gray, I'm uh, sorry, um, Grush may have been involved in that. That he was one of the witnesses called into that. So, do you, can you respond to that? I mean, was Grush part of those classified hearings in the House and Senate? And so that means that his full I testimony. I don't know that he was. was. I don't know that he was talking that far back. I mean, we have a pretty good idea of some of the people that were in there, but you know. Who, there were who some very, very vocal people um, talking about the whole UFO topic. Remember Marco Rubio? Yeah, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Well, after that last set of classified hearings happened, those guys came out of there stone-faced and silent. It's like, you know, where'd Rubio go? Crickets. And it, it really makes you wonder what they were told. Because one of the things that I postulate often is that it's a lot easier to get somebody to keep a secret if they believe in the secret, than it is to tell them if you reveal the secret, there's going to be penalties. And I'm really concerned that that these guys were brought into because these are really the only major hearings that we know of in both uh, committees that happened around the UFO topic recently um, that were that official. And these guys walked out of there very very quiet, and none of them was going to talk about anything. And it makes you wonder: were they told something that? made them understand why this is going to be kept a secret and it made them back off um and and i think that that's quite possible mm -hmm. yeah that's very uh, interesting well on october 26 there was a um a skiff was used for uh, the inspector general of the department of defense to give a briefing to the UFO con or what well, to the House Oversight Committee. And I know Tim Burchett and uh, Representative Luna came out of that very disappointed. So I, I guess you mm -hmm. want to address that? Yeah, they're pointing to the whole fact that everything's compartmentalized. And it's everything we've been talking about previously in our conversation is how they were given briefings by people that only had certain amounts of information and no ability to expand. On, on broader information because they're not read in. And so the, the lengths that these guys are going through to keep this deception is off the charts. And, and the more we push, the more they push back. And it's, it's hard to watch and it's so obvious at this point that, and, and we've got guys like Tim Burchett who is not going to give up. Yeah, I've talked to Tim several times privately and publicly and he's got his teeth in this topic, and it's going to take a lot to get him to walk away from it. I don't think he's going to. He's going to be a crusader for this cause for as long as he can do it. And hats off to Tim. Uh, he's a true hero in all of this. Well, you know, so far you've, you've described the compartmentalization, the process by which um, people in Congress that are trying to get to the bottom of it are, are kind of um, stymied, they can't get to the truth. But yet we have this incredible uh, legislation that was proposed by uh, Chuck Schumer, of all people, uh, the UAP Disclosure Act uh, for 2023 that, you know, when I, when I read, I thought, wow, this is well thought out. This Whoever put this out there really wants to 
develop a, a credible thought out process for getting this information into the public arena. So it didn't strike me as something that was developed on the fly. You know, this was well thought out. No. So there are people that want this to come out. So you want to talk about the Disclosure Act and what's who's really behind it? Why is it being pushed? Well, here's the thing. Even this new Disclosure Act, there's already evidence of the Pentagon trying to figure out ways to wiggle around it. And we've already put out several pieces of legislation that are supposed to help, uh, you know, pierce the veil on this. And they've been ineffective so far because they're being fought against. And, you know, the thing about laws is, especially when you're dealing with the letter of the law, is there's always a place to find a loophole to get you around it. And so the perfect legislation to force the ultimate truth to come out, they're in this this kind of quest to find it. What can we do that's going to make these guys tell us what we want to know? And it's just an ongoing battle just to do that. And who's behind the legislation? There's a whole group of people in Congress that want this information out. Um, and the more people make noise, the louder they're going to get. The the And then there's the fact that the information has to come out. At some point, humanity is going to evolve into a new awareness of itself and a new understanding that we're not alone, that we're part of a broader web of life. And for whatever implications that carries, the government cannot continue to turn a blind eye to this, and continue to lie about it. And so it's going to be this ongoing challenge. What information is going to come out? How are we going to force it? And honestly, what we're seeing as as spectators watching it unfold in the media is we're seeing a huge behind the scenes battle we're seeing the front facing evidence of that uh, and something that's going on behind the scenes between factions that have closely guarded this secret and factions that don't believe the secret should be guarded and they're powerful on both sides and so we're watching it unfold and and manifest in in the way that it is well, uh, you mentioned to me kind of uh, before we started this Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. So, you know, what's all that about? This is pretty cool. So um, uh, Steve Bassett and Dan Herrera, who's a pretty well-known publicist, have put together a group called the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. On November 2nd, everybody's meeting to get, sorry, I have allergies going on for the first time. And uh, <laughs> it's it's a group of Hollywood heavyweights, producers, actors, and UFO people and everybody that's in the alliance is dedicated to helping to steer the mainstream media into programming that embraces the, the truth of disclosure. And so it's a it's a it's you know who knows where it's going to evolve, but it's 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 an organization now. It's solid. You can find out more at HollywoodDisclosureAlliance.com. Uh, and this is a group of people that have power in the media that want disclosure, and our voices are going to be heard in pretty much a lot of the stuff that you see come out of Hollywood addressing the issue. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Yeah, that that is that is very, very exciting. Now, in Accidental Truth, uh, you also talk about the work of John Mack and you interview Elizabeth April, and both of those represent two different constituencies that are kind of like underrepresented in the kind of UFO literature, that is the ab abductees and the contactees. So you want to talk about both of those and what what, what their testimonies reveal? Yeah, you know, um, the experiencers are about to have their day. We've had the fact that UFOs are real now, flying saucers are real, there's things that we can't explain. It's all in the public now. So the next shoe to drop is going to be the reality of the experiencer phenomenon being uh, Elizabeth April is a voice of her generation. People, some people criticize me for putting her in there. They wanted to say things about her work and blah, blah. I find her very, very interesting. And some of the stories that she told me on camera and off camera about her own personal experiences as an experiencer are corroborated by other people. So I had no problem including her in there as a voice of the new generation of experiencer talking to the new generation of humans uh, who are having more and more uh, close encounters with non-human intelligence. And then, you know, John Mack was one of the guys that broke the ice on acknowledging that the experiencer phenomenon is real. And 
so I think that the next big wave of information is going to be, uh, yes, people are having experiences. They're real. They're not crazy. And then, of course, you're going to say, we don't know exactly what they are, exactly where they're coming from. But uh, but yes, there is some non-human intelligence or maybe a number of them directly interacting with members of our population on a conscious level. That's going to be the next big piece of information. And so I think it's just really exciting. The experiencers are about to have their day. And it's been a shame that people have lived entire lifetimes in shame and embarrassment and wonder and and just fear really not knowing what was happening to them not being able to talk to anybody about it experiences are have had a rough ride and i think that that's about to get better for for these people yeah i'm, I'm glad you said that because i think that is actually very true and uh, certainly some one of the things that I noticed when I got involved in this exopolitics field back in 2001, that the accounts of experiences, I mean, they, they were kind of like frowned upon, you know, generally in the public arena. But the ones that were most critical were uh, UFO researchers. And that, that really struck me as odd that UFO researchers, I mean, you go back to people like George Adamski and Howard Menger. I mean, if you look at George Adamski's testimony, I mean, he had a lot of supporting evidence. I mean, he had he had photographs, he had uh, corroborating witnesses. They even took uh, footprints of Orthon that was part of this desert contacting experience in 1952. But the UFO community just dumped big time on Adamski and discredited him. People like Timothy Good that did try to do a fair analysis of, and Wendell Stevens tried to do a fair analysis of Adamski that they were, you know, they weren't supported. They were criticized for doing that. So I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because I think that because we get a, a like a bird's eye view of what the extraterrestrials are doing if we start to listen to the experiences. You know, it's exactly right. And when we talk about all these efforts in the past to shed light on the topic, we also have to realize that government disinformation agents have been a part of the ufology community from day one uh you know mufon itself is an organization that is really dedicated to to getting to the truth but they've always had uh, somebody watching over them at the very least monitoring what they're doing we we've this topic has been um plagued by people that are trying to control the information that we choose to focus on and the information that we choose to put out and you know the experiencer phenomenon it was just super easy to write this off as yeah these people are all nuts and and that worked for a really long time it even worked on people within our own community and then you would get occasionally people that come out with stories that are just so far out and so bizarre that it adds credibility to the people that don't think they have any credibility so the experiencers have had a rough go of it and in a lot of ways, some of the people that have tried to capitalize on the experience or phenomenon have helped make it worse. And a lot of the people that have tried to shed light on it have had nothing but problems doing it coming from all different angles. And I think now with new scientific breakthroughs, like we talk about in Accidental Truth, we're learning that consciousness is far more vast and there's parts of our brain that are operating that we're not aware of in methods of information exchange that we don't understand. And as that stuff gets scientifically validated, the experiences become more and more credible. Well, I know you uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Gary Nolan in Accidental Truth, and he identified the basal gag uh, ganglia yes. as responsible for higher brain functions associated with uh, possible ET contacting communications. And to me, this this would m mark a clear difference between experiences and so-called you know, normal people, if we want to go there, uh, that experiences have some heightened brain capacity. Uh, you know, s what some of the people I've worked with, uh, they have uh, particularly high gamma brainwave activity, uh, which enables them to be able to interact with um, extraterrestrial technologies, whereas normal humans actually suffer severe brain injuries and, and and so yeah gary nolan i think there was a, a segment with tucker carlson where uh, tucker carlson said he spoke to a stanford researcher about a decade ago who told him that a hundred air force pilots mm -hmm. had suffered severe brain um, injuries 
with, after interacting with UFOs. So yeah, I mean, yeah, this is this is work Gary was doing way back in the day. Um, he's been brought in on a lot of stuff. So the basal ganglia, uh, what they're finding is historically, even before modern medicine, it's been referred to as kind of an intuition center. Uh, and and they found you know evidence that that's true. And so experiencers seem to have a heightened level of activity and a more advanced um, basal ganglia in their minds, uh, in their brains. And so it, we're just scratching the surface of all this. But see, this gives a little bit of scientific credibility to to this stuff, and that's what it's going to take is new understanding, new understandings in consciousness, and new understandings of the physical brain and our physical reality to help explain the stuff that come not from just the word of experiencers, but from outside discoveries that help explain what they're telling us. And so we're, we're on a Renaissance. I, I said it here first, you might be saying it too. We're, we're entering a Renaissance of understanding around the experiencer phenomenon. And, you know, there's also a situation where more and more people are feeling personally contacted and if non-human intelligence wants to truly interact with us, they, they're showing us that they can bypass the government and they can bypass the secrecy and they can come directly to people through experiences that cannot be denied and leave impressions on people one person at a time. And it's happening at an accelerating rate. Well, I, I agree with you. I think uh, the experiences, uh, what they have been able to achieve or learn through their contact experiences, through their communications, that that is going to be um, a big reveal. I think the information that I've seen uh, shared by these experiences you know, gives us a, a, a kind of very rich perspective on what the extraterrestrials have been doing, aside from you know studying the hardware and the UFOs that, you know, in terms of like galactic organizations and all of that, that speaks to ancient history. I mean, you, you if you go back to the Sumerian records, I mean, the ancient aliens, you go to the Enuma Elish, I mean, there they're talking about an assembly of the gods. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's a, kind of like another term for this galactic federation that uh, uh, General Haim Eshed talked about back in 2019. So I, I think, yeah, we, we at some point we're going to start talking about these uh, organisations that the extraterrestrials belong to uh, that go back thousands of years according to the Sumerian texts yeah and and you know there's there seems to be a lot of unwillingness on the part of both sides the the traditional religious teachings and the uh, the UFO people to understand that these these mythos and these legends all intertwine and um, they, you know they everybody's clinging to their own not everybody but people are clinging to their own version of what this is. And we need a lot more open-mindedness to truly get it. Uh, th that's what I believe is. And so um, you find that the, the ancient religious teachings and stories are intertwined with the, with the societal things and, and what we're seeing happen, but there's an unwillingness to allow them to fuse. It's almost like if you listen to the story about the Sumerians and the and the gods and the and the different the, the giants and all this stuff that comes out of old biblical teachings. The, if you just realize that maybe this is a story about different aliens doing different things, all of a sudden it starts to make a lot of sense. So why is everybody so uh, divided over what it means and what it is, and why does it have to be that way? Why can't if we have a little bit better open mindedness toward the whole situation? we're going to understand it better. Now, I know that was one of the things that uh, you were told. I think uh, Louis Alexander mentioned something about there are people in the Pentagon that are very religious and they're anti-disclosure. Uh, maybe they... Well, they, they just think that this whole thing settles into an angelic, demonic um, energy. And, you know, it's not about aliens and nuts and bolts, flesh and blood creatures from other planets with flying saucers that operate on technology it's all spiritual essences that are at war for the soul of humanity and that that's why we shouldn't be dabbling in it because it's like you know playing with black magic you don't know what you're doing you might get in trouble 
So, and, and yeah, there's this actual mentality. And Lou, he didn't just say it to me. He also mentioned it in the show Unidentified. And I make sure that I tell people that because I don't want to be like, well, secondhand information from somebody that's not verified from another source. But yeah, apparently this is going on. So what's your next uh, big UFO project? Doing the director's cut for Accidental Truth. Obviously, it's an ongoing work in progress. At the website, accidentaltruths.com or mufontelevision.com forward slash AT Insider, we're posting updates and, and cool stuff. And then I'm doing a Life After Death film um, that is kind of a, that, that's just the next topic that, that I'm dabbling in. I've done uh, I've done three documentaries about ghost hunting, and so my favorite topics are the for filmmaking is life after death, uh, the UFO topic, and then the whole nature of reality. Are we living in a simulation? So I did the UFO film for this part of my life, and uh, we're up to twenty four awards now. That we've just won six more. I won best director of a documentary, um, best documentary, best educational film by a. Uh, the 40th Film Festival in Europe, so I was pretty excited. Won six well, awards in one festival. But um, and then you know the 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 third one is going to be well, what is the nature of reality? Because I think the life after death question, the ET question, all of these things play into us achieving a broader understanding of our very reality itself. It's it, none of it is an independent, standalone topic. It all intertwines towards greater answers. So that's next. Okay, so Accidental Truth, I watched that on Amazon, so you can get it there on Prime. And I think you have a website, accidentaltruth.com. Uh, yeah, Accidental Truths with an S. So it's accidentaltruths.com. And you know, I, I, I can say it, I think you can watch it for free now. I know it's on Tubi and a bunch of other places that are ad supported video platforms. So, you know, if you want to watch it commercial free, get it on Amazon or Apple. Uh, but you know, if you've been waiting for it to come out so that everybody has access to it, it's out there now, and, and I'm fine with that. I think it's great. And then the um, we just released the DVDs and Blu-rays, so I know there's people out there that want those, and you can get those also at the website accidentaltruths.com if you want to get a Blu-ray or a T-shirt or you know anything to help us uh, support the ongoing work. Well, thanks, Ron, for being on XF Politics today, and I wish you all the best for future projects. Thank you. And you know, anytime you, you, you'd like to have me back on, I'm happy to do it. Like I said, I've been a fan of your work for a long time and uh, it's an honor to be on the show. Yep. Well, I think uh, what you're doing with that Hollywood Disclosure Initiative, that's uh, something I'd like to follow up on in the future. For sure. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.